Hey everybody, welcome back to the 2019 Halloween edition of Mrs. H. This is part 9 of Took by Mary Downing Hahn. We are picking up on chapter number 17. The next day, Mrs. O'Neill picked me up around 3. Celine huddled in the back seat. Hugging the doll, her face mournful. Snowflakes drifted in the gray air, floating up and down, swirling like tiny moths. By the time we parked in front of Miss Perkins' house, an inch of the fluffy stuff coated the old snow, making it look fresh and new. We walked to the front of the door silently. No one had said much during the ride into Woodville. I think we were each locked in our own thoughts, wondering what Miss Perkins might tell us, each of us hoping. We waited on the cold porch for at least five minutes before the door opened and Miss Perkins stepped aside to let us enter. Three cats shot out of the house and two ran in. Inside, it was dark and cold and smelly as before. A small fire burned low on the hearth, but we didn't take off our coats. For a while, no one spoke. As if, it was as if we were waiting for Miss Perkins to tell us something, and she was waiting for us to tell her something. A black cat crept into her lap, and two more emerged from the shadows to crouch at her feet. They watched us steadily, unblinking. I wondered how she could tell them apart. The fire popped and crackled, and the wind did its best to squeeze in through every crack. Celine coughed. Mrs. O'Neill crossed and uncrossed her ankles. Somewhere in the back of the house, a cat yowled. There must be dozens of them, I thought, mostly black, gray, and dark tabbies. This is how it is, Miss Perkins said suddenly. Celine, there's no way you can go back to my auntie. She don't want you no more. You must learn to live in the here and the now, or die. Them's your choices. If I was you, I would choose to live. Tears ran down Celine's face, but she said nothing. She simply sat and stared as if she were a cat too, half wild, not one you dared to pet. Miss Perkins turned her eyes to me. She means to keep your sister for 50 years, she said, just like she kept Celine and all the ones before her. <clears throat> there must be something you can do, I whispered. My family is wrecked. My mother, my father... I couldn't go on without losing my self-control and throwing myself at her feet, crying and begging for help. I didn't say there's no way your sister can get back, Miss Perkins spoke so sharply that the cat on her lap raised its head, startled out of its nap. Have you actually spoken to her? Mrs. O'Neill asked. Not exactly, Miss Perkins stroked the cat on her lap. I've got my ways of finding out things on the sly. Things folks don't want me to know. Things I don't want them to know I'm interested in. Mrs. O'Neill nodded as if she understood. But like me, I was sure she didn't quite see what the old woman meant. But she was a witch and we weren't. So why should we expect to understand? Miss Perkins stretched a hand toward Celine. Bring me that dolly, dear. Celine gripped the doll. What do you want with her? She's mine. The old woman leaned towards Celine and stared into her eyes. The dolly, she said. Give me the dolly. The air seemed charged with electricity, and my skin tingled as if thunderstorms were rolling through the house. I wanted to jump up and run from the dark room and the craziness of the old woman, but something kept me right where I was. Celine rose slowly and gave the doll to Miss Perkins. Good girl, she said as Celine backed away and collapsed on the sofa. Mrs. O'Neill put her arm around her. For once, Celine did not pull away. In the meantime, Miss Perkins turned the doll this way and that, studying her intently in the dim light of the fire. She caressed little Erica, moved her arms and legs, and hummed to herself, as if she'd forgotten we were in the room. After a minute or so, she bent her head over the cat in her lap and seemed to listen. He made a strange sound. Not a meow, not a growl, not a purr, but something like all three. She nodded her head slowly. At last, Miss Perkins looked up. Her eyes seemed unfocused, as if she weren't seeing us or the room, but was looking at something far away. Celine and I moved closer to Mrs. O'Neill. She held us both tightly. 
Miss Perkins slowly came back to the room, and the fire and the three of us. Her sharp eyes fixed themselves on me. Come here, boy. Come close. Even though I <clears throat> wanted to stay where I was, safe and warm beside Mrs. O'Neill, I did as she said. The old woman smelled of dried grass and herbs and flowers. A nice smell. I sniffed and breathed it in, feeling it spread through me like magic. How much do you want your little sister back, boy? She whispered. Her eyes probed me. i do anything to get her away from Auntie. Will you go to Auntie's cabin tonight, all by yourself? No mammy, no pappy, nobody. All by yourself. Just you. Are you brave enough? I stared at her, almost speechless. Tonight? You said you wanted your sister back. You said you'll do anything. This is the onlyest way to do it. I glanced at Mrs. O'Neill to see what she thought. Her eyes were open, but unfocused, as blank as little Erica's eyes. She and Celine seemed to be in a trance. Miss Perkins leaned toward me and studied my face. You brave enough? Because if you ain't, you'll never see your sister till 50 years from now, and that one there will soon be dead. She nodded at Celine. It's for both these girls you're doing it. You break the spell for your sister, you break it for Celine too. Once the spells broke, Auntie will be finished. The dark will take her. I tried to stand tall and straight. Maybe if I acted brave, I would be brave. What do I have to do? My voice came out in a squeak. You go to the door of that cabin at midnight. Not one minute earlier, not one minute later. Knock three times, and Auntie will call out. Who's that knock-knock knocking at my door? You'll say. A poor traveler last, lost in the cold, and she will say, Well, what you want with me? You'll say, To sit by your fire a spell. Miss Perkins stroked the cat's black fur and crooned to him. Except for the wind and the fire, the room was as still as death. She'll ask you to tell her a riddle, she went on. First you say, I bring you a cherry without a stone. Miss Perkins reached into her pocket and drew out a blossom. She laid it carefully on the table beside her. A cherry don't have a stone when it's blooming. Second, say, I brung you a chicken without a bone. Miss Perkins took an egg from her pocket and laid it beside the blossom. A chicken don't have bones while it's in the egg. They're old riddles, she said. Everyone knows the answers. So she'll ask for something harder. A riddle she's never heard before. The old woman coughed and sniffed and fidgeted with the doll. Last of all, say, I brung you a servant that never tires and never grows old. She added little Erica to the objects on the table. It ain't a riddle she'll have heard before. If she can't guess the answer in three tries, she's got to open the door and let you in. My heart knocked about in my chest, hammering and pounding my ribs. But when she sees me, she'll know who I am. Auntie ain't the only one that knows her way around the dark side of the moon. I got tricks of my own, boy. She won't know you. I'll see to that. The cat interrupted her with an odd, questioning sort of noise. Miss Perkins stroked him till he purred loud enough to make my bones vibrate. Soon as you're through the door, she went on, Auntie will ask you for the answer to the riddle. Open the sack and show her the servant that never tires and never grows old. Once she sees that dolly, She'll forget about your sister, at least for a while. But I couldn't stop myself from interrupting the old woman again. She knows the doll belongs to Erica. And how can a doll be a servant? She's plastic. She's not alive. She can't move or talk or... Hush up and quit asking fool questions. You've got to trust me, boy. Get your sister out of the cabin as fast as you can. She won't want to come. You'll have to drag her away. Run for home like you got wings on your heels or seven league boots on your feet. But what if... Don't vex me no more, boy. Do what I tell you. Bring your sister home, and the spell will bust at sunrise for both girls. They'll remember who they are in this world, but they won't remember nothing about Angie's world. Miss Perkins scrunched her face into a tight fist, and the cat lashed his tail and hissed at me. My brain whirled with questions, but my voice had dried up and my mouth felt, felt numb, the way it does in a dentist's office when he gives you Novocaine. 
I nodded as if I understood, and I hoped I'd be able to do all she asked. Miss Perkins put my sister's doll into a burlap sack, tied it shut, and gave it to me. No matter what, don't open this sack until you're inside the cabin, and don't be scared of the dolly. Before I could ask her why I'd be scared of a doll, she gave me a warning look, and I shut my mouth. Miss Perkins nodded, took a deep breath, and let it out slowly. <clears throat> now go sit on that sofa and keep your mouth shut about everything I done told you. I took my place next to Mrs. O'Neill, who continued to stare straight ahead at nothing I could see. Miss Perkins murmured a few words to the cat. The moment he closed his eyes, Mrs. O'Neill and Celine came back from wherever they'd been. They stretched and yawned as if they had been napping. Celine looked bewildered as if she wasn't quite sure where she was. Although I expected her to ask about the doll, she didn't say a word. Thank you for your time, Mrs. O'Neill said to Miss Perkins. I'm sorry you can't do anything to help us. That poor child. Fifty years is a long time. The years will go by in a flash. Miss Perkins picked up a ball of yarn and her knitting, a lumpy black scarf already long enough to wrap two or three times around her neck. Gently helping Celine to her feet, Mrs. O'Neill turned to me. Come along, Daniel. The snow's getting worse. Your parents must be worried. See yourselves out, Miss Perkins said. I'm a mite weary tonight. When you're old as me, the cold settles in your bones and sets them to aching and scraping against each other. Good night, then, Mrs. O'Neill said. Take care of yourself, Miss Perkins. You too, dearie. And don't fret yourself about the snow. It'll stop soon enough. We left Miss Perkins sitting by the fire, knitting and humming to herself while the cat dozed on her lap. Outside, the cold air froze the hairs of my nose, and my eyes watered, but I was glad to be away from the smoky smell of that house. I kept the sack behind my back, but no one noticed it. Celine sat behind me with her nose pressed against the window and watched the empty streets of Woodville glide past. A flake or two of snow drifted past the windshield, but Miss Perkins was right. The moon was already breaking through the clouds. As usual, our house looked dark and vacant. As it had the previous night, a lamp glimmered in Mom's bedroom window, but the downstairs windows were lit only by the headlights of the car. Mrs. O'Neill stared at the house. My goodness, Daniel, is anyone home? They're upstairs, I said. The light's on in the bedroom. Dad's office is in the back. That's where he is where he always is, lost in computer games and websites for missing children. As I opened the car door, she asked, Do you want me to come with you? No, it's okay. Everything's fine. What a good liar I was getting to be. Thanks for taking me to see Miss Perkins again. While we talked, I was aware of Celine watching me through the window. I waved to her, but she turned away. Mrs. O'Neill said goodbye and turned around slowly her headlights washing over the unpainted sides of our house. I watched the taillights grow small as the car disappeared around the curve in the driveway. The kitchen looked the way it always did, sink full of dirty dishes, trash can overflowing with pizza boxes, beer cans, and wine bottles, table littered with newspapers, paper plates, coffee cups, forks and knives and spoons, and empty wine bottles, ashtrays heaped with cigarette butts. Dad? Mom? I called. Up here, Dad answered. I climbed the back stairs slowly, keeping the sack behind my back. It was the new normal. Dad playing a war game on the computer. Mom huddled in her room under a quilt, reading. We saved some pizza for you, Mom said. It's in the fridge. Just heat some up in the microwave. Thanks. I stowed the sack under my bed and went down to the kitchen to warm up the pizza. The crust tasted like burned cardboard, and the cheese had turned into something that resembled melted plastic and stuck to my teeth, but I ate it anyway. I was going to be out in the cold a long time. I needed something in my belly. For a while, I sat at the table and watched the clock. 7 p.m., 8 p.m., time crept past. Upstairs, my parents were silently engrossed in their books and games. I said goodnight to them and went to my room. They barely acknowledged my presence. It was as if I had disappeared, too. If I failed tonight, if bloody bones killed and ate me, would they care? 
Would they send anyone to look for me? Or would they just sink deeper and deeper into the house, burrowing under blankets, eating bad pizza, drinking, smoking, not even noticing I was gone? For at least an hour, I stood at my window, trying to remember the way our family used to be, but only seeing myself teasing Erica and making her cry, forcing her to leave the doll in the woods. Why had I been so mean to her? I shivered in the cold air that leaked through the loose window panes and watched the wind blow the clouds away. The moon sailed into sight and shone on the snowy fields. In its bright light, I saw the beginning of the path that led to Auntie's cabin. I glanced at my clock. 10.30. It was time to go. Chapter 18 I hauled the burlap sack out from under the bed, grabbed a flashlight, and tiptoed downstairs. Even though I'd heard Dad go to bed, and I knew Mom was with him, the house felt empty. So dark and cold and silent, I could hear my own breathing. I pulled one of Erica's old jackets off the coat rack, grabbed a pair of mittens, a hat, and her red boots, and stuffed everything into a backpack. Zipping my parka, I stepped into the darkness. The cold wind hit me like a fist, and this freezing air hurt my chest. Crouched in the snow, I took a long look at the house. Then, with my head down, I ran across the field and into the woods. No one but deer and small animals had walked on the path since it snowed, so I slipped and slid and sank to my knees over and over again, clambering out of one snowdrift and stumbling into another. The burlap sack made everything worse. With every step I took, it grew heavier. I didn't understand how the doll could weigh so much. Maybe plowing through the snow was taking all my energy, leaving me tired and weak-legged. I was about to open the sack to make sure something else wasn't in there. A few boulders, maybe? But I remembered that Miss Perkins had told me. If I wanted to see to rescue Erica, I had to do exactly what the woman said. By the time I reached the trail to the top of the Brewster's Hill, I was exhausted. There was no protection from the wind. Snow blew in my face hard. Icy pellets stung my skin and made my forehead ache. Every now and then, I glimpsed shadowy shapes in the darkness. Dear, I hoped. There were noises, too. Owls, foxes, and the low mutters of other things, growling and snarling. Squ squealing and yelping in the woods. Brody told me there were wild hogs up here. Razorbacks, like bloody bones. I told myself it wasn't the monster hog I heard out there, but my knees shook with fear. The sack grew so heavy I could barely drag it up the hill. Gasping for breath, I thought it was like a backpack that never weighed much when I left home, but grew heavier after an hour or so of hiking. I felt like Atlas carrying the world on my shoulders. Again, I was tempted to open the sack and take out whatever was weighing it down, but when I started to fumble with the rope that held it closed, I swear I heard Miss Perkins' voice in the wind telling me not to do it. I sighed and began climbing again, dragging the sack behind me. When I finally reached the top of the hill, it was almost midnight. Stunned, I stared at the scene before me. No longer in ruins, the cabin looked like something in a fairy tale. Snow covered its roof, icicles hung from its eaves, smoke rose from its chimney, and candles glowed in its windows. I crept closer, scared that old auntie would hear my footsteps. After hiding my backpack behind a rock near the cabin, I laid the sack down by the cabin door, glad to be relieved of its weight. Shadows cast by the windblown trees made the sack seem to be moving. Uneasily, I edged away from it. It wasn't a trick of the shadows. The sack had begun to move, as if something inside it wanted to get out. I heard old auntie walking around inside the cabin, berating someone in a harsh voice. Lazy girl, stupid girl, she said. You ain't worth a wooden nickel. The girl afore you done all I asked and more, but you act like you never scrubbed a pot in your life. I heard a smack and a low cry. Don't hit me, Auntie. I'm doing my best. Erica, I thought. Erica's in there. Yet I stood at the door like a statue, afraid to raise my hand and knock. Well, your best ain't good enough, is it? Another slap and another cry from my sister. The moon cast my shadow on the door, making me seem much larger than I was. I forced myself to knock three times. 
From inside, a shrill voice called, Who's that? Knock, knock, knocking at my door. A poor traveler lost in the cold. Fear made it hard to keep my voice steady. What you want with me? To sit by your fire a spell. Ask me a riddle, and maybe I'll let you in. <clears throat> I took a deep breath, hoping I remember the words. I said, I brung you a cherry without a stone. A cherry when it's blooming, it has no stone. Old Aunt Auntie answered, Ask me another that ain't so easy. I brung you a chicken that has no bone. Ha! Another easy one. A chicken when it's pipping, it has no bone. Old Auntie laughed. Now you tell me one I ain't heard, laddie, and make it snappy. I brung you a servant that never tires and never grows old. At my feet, the sack lurched wildly, and a harsh voice cried, Let me out! I backed away in horror, but inside the cabin, all was silent. Auntie must have been mulling over the riddle. A servant that never tires and never grows old? Yes, ma'am. The sack heaved. Let me out! Is the answer time? Auntie called. No, ma'am. Another silence. You sure it's not time? Yes, ma'am. That's right. Time ain't nobody's servant, she muttered. Tell the way around, I reckon. Another moment of silence. How about water? Is that the answer? No, ma'am. Again, the sack twitched to life, and again, the voice cried, Let me out! Is it fire, then? Auntie asked through the door. No, none of them is right, ma'am. That was three wrong guesses. She had to let me in. Sure enough, a key jiggled in a lock, and the door slowly opened. The old woman who terrified me in the woods, poked her heads out. Spotting the sack, she said, What's in that there gunny sack? The answer to the riddle, I told her. Let me in, and you'll see. She stepped back. I dragged the sack inside. It was all I could do to manage it. It humped and swayed from side to side. Something in that sack was definitely alive. Behind old auntie, my sister crouched by the fire. Although I told myself that Erica might not look like herself, I had no idea she'd be almost unrecognizable. Thin and pale, dirty and barefoot, her hair an uncombed thicket of tangles, she wore a colorless, shapeless dress that hung loosely from her bony frame. More than anyone else, she looked like Celine, the same sullen expression on her face, the same fear, the same exhaustion. She could have been Celine's twin. It was clear that she didn't know me, and judging by the look in her eyes, she didn't trust me either. How was I to get her out of the cabin and drag her all the way home? Auntie must have noticed me staring at Erica because she said, Don't pay her no mind. She ain't nobody. Just girl. The worst servant I ever had. Don't know the meaning of work. Hiding her face, Erica fed twigs into the fire. I'm sorry, Auntie, she whispered. I do my best. I told you your best ain't nearly good enough, girl. Old Auntie started struggling with the rope that tied the sack closed. There's something alive in here, she cried. It wants out. Get away, laddie. Let's see what you brung me. She shoved me aside. At that moment, I was more scared of the doll than I was of old Auntie. It's my servant, ain't it? The answer to that there riddle about never getting tired and never getting old. She tore the sack open, and the doll jumped out. It was the size of Erica herself, but it looked nothing like little Erica. Its hair tangled and fell over its bony face like a thicket of brambles. Its arms were long and skinny, its sharp nails like claws. It wore tatters of clothing, stained and faded. The fabric was so thin I saw its ribs. With a grin as wicked as death, the conjure woman laughed with delight and picked up the doll. Why, ain't you the ugliest little creature I ever did see? Let me down, Hanty, let me down. As soon as its feet hit the floor, it grabbed a broom and began sweeping, running this way and that like a wind-up toy, lurching and bumping into things, knocking furniture over, breaking bowls, scattering Auntie's things like leaves in a winter storm. Auntie, Auntie, it cried, catch me if you can. While Auntie chased it around the cabin, I grabbed Erica and hauled her toward the door. Just as I expected, she fought the way Celine had, kicking, scratching, and biting. It was like holding a wild animal. Auntie, she screamed, Auntie! But the old woman was too busy to notice what was happening. 
Or maybe she didn't care about my sister now that she had a new servant. She caught the creature and slapped its face hard. Bad girl, she screamed and shook it until its bones rattled and its head bobbed. Look what you done. Once Erica and I were outside, I held her still, forced her arms into the jacket sleeves, and zipped up the front. I jammed the hat on her head, but she kicked so hard I couldn't get the boots on her feet. Abandoning them, I snatched up my backpack and dragged my sister toward the trail. Auntie! Auntie! she shrieked. What's wrong with you? I shook her. We've got to get away from here. Leave me be. I don't want to go anywhere. I'm your brother. I've come to take you home. Liar! You ain't my brother. I don't have no brother. I got no one save for Auntie. No home but here. Erica thrashed and flailed and kicked. Let me go! Let me go! I held her tight and kept going, stumbling through the snow. Behind us, I heard a sort of grunting, squealing, growling sound. I looked back and saw bloody bones come out of the trees. The moon shone on his bald head and cast a shadow across the snow, his ragged clothes fluttering in the wind. I saw his bones and his claws and his sharp teeth. Even though Erica slowed me down, I ran and jumped over the snow, going as fast as I could. Bloody Bones wasn't going to stop me from bringing my sister home and making things right again. Behind us, the cabin door opened, and old Auntie screamed, Get them, dear boy! Bring them back to me! No, Auntie, Erica cried. Don't sick him on me! I'll work hard! I'll do things right, I promise! Still struggling to keep hold of my sister, I slipped and slid down the trail, trying to keep us from falling. The wind blew us toward the edge of the drop-off. Roots and stones rose up to trip us, but I kept going, forcing Erica to keep up with me. Bloody bones crashed through the snow behind us, gaining on us with every step. I imagined his breath as foul as death itself, his sharp claws squeezing around my throat, his eyeless skull looming over me in the moonlight. Don't let them get away! Old Auntie's voice was mingled with the wind shrieking through the trees. Stop them! They'll bring us both to ruin! Bloody Bones snuffled and snorted. His bones rattled. He was gaining on us. I felt him grab at my jacket and miss. I tried to run faster, but a stone turned under my feet, and I fell. I lost my grip on Erica and lay stunned. Above me stood Bloody Bones. While I lay in the snow staring up at him, he threw back his head and snorted. Then he bent down and pulled me to my feet. His bear claws sank into my shoulders. His face was so close I could see his tusks and his panther fangs and his empty eye sockets. The stink of him made me gag. His bones rattled as he lifted me above his head. He was going to throw me off the cliff. Just as he tensed to hurl me into the valley, I heard the crack of something hard hit bloody bones. He staggered backward away from the edge of the cliff and lost his hold on me. One leg collapsed, and he fell with a clatter of bones. As he struggled to stand, another rock hit him. This one broke his arm clean off. The shattered bones dropped into the snow. Howling with anger, bloody bones lunged toward me. His one arm outstretched to push me to my death, his right leg useless. Without thinking of anything but surviving, I dodged away from him. Unable to stop in time, Bloody Bones plunged over the edge of the cliff, screaming as he bounced from rock to rock, his bones flying apart and scattering as he went. In seconds, he was gone, leaving only the echo of his scream. Auntie hobbled down the trail toward us. <clears throat> my boy, my dear boy, she screamed, her face and voice filled with rage and sorrow. What have you done, you miserable, wicked creature? I backed away, but it wasn't me the conjure woman was speaking to. Erica stood behind me. Pale and trembling, she held a rock in each hand. Old Auntie flung a string of strange words at both of us, but the wind turned them back on her. Raising her hands as if to fend off what she'd said, she began backing slowly up the trail. What will I do now without my dear boy? she cried. With each step she took, the wind blew harder and her shadow grew fainter her body less solid. By the time she vanished into the woods, she was almost transparent. Auntie! Erica stretched her arms toward the old woman. Auntie, I'm sorry. Don't leave me. I only meant to stop him from hurting the boy. Seizing my sister's arm, I yanked, down, yanked her down the trail. 
She was still struggling when she looked back and screamed, The cabin's on fire! It's burning! Put it out! Save her! I spun around. At the top of Brewster's Hill, the flames leapt into the air, lighting the bare trees with an orange glow, sending sparks shooting up toward the winter sky. With a burst of strength, Erica broke away from me and ran up the trail. I ran after her, but this time she was too fast for me. I caught up with her at the cabin, or what was left of it. The old rotten wood had exploded in flames and burned so fast that the fire was already flickering over charred logs. Smoke blew sideways in the wind. Embers scattered. I kept a firm grip on Erica to keep her from running into the ruins to rescue Auntie. She's gone, I said. Dead and gone, I hoped. Burned to ashes. You can't do anything for her now. Erica collapsed against me, sobbing. Now I got nobody. No home. Nothing. The fight had gone out of her. I held her tight and wondered if I'd ever hugged her before. I couldn't remember, but I kind of doubted it. Right now, though, I wanted to hold her for a long time. Never let her go. Never let anything bad ever happen to her again. You have me, I told her, and Mom and Dad. She shook her head and snuffled. I ain't got nobody, she insisted. No brother, no sister, no mother, no father. In tears, she pulled away from me and stumbled down the hill. She had nothing more to say, and neither did I. As we came out of the woods, I pointed to our house, a dark box in the field, moonlight glinting off the glass in its windows. That's where we live, I told her. You and me, and Mom and Dad. I never saw that house. I never lived there. Her voice was as dull and lifeless as Celine's, but she led me, let me lead her into the kitchen. Mom, Dad, I shouted. Come down here. Upstairs, a bed creaked. Footsteps crossed the door. The floor and a door opened. Daniel, Dad called. What are you shouting about? It's 3 a.m. Come see. In a few seconds, I'd be a hero. The boy who rescued his sister from the old conjure woman. They'd be so happy, so proud of me. I could hardly wait for them to see Erica. Dad fumbled with a hall light and came slowly downstairs, barely awake from the sound of it. He stopped halfway and stared at Erica. What's that girl doing here? I thought she was staying with the O'Neills. Your mother won't... I stared at him, shocked. Dad, it's Erica. I found her. Are you crazy? Dad asked. Have you completely lost your mind? Mom appeared behind him. Why did you bring that creature here? I won't have her in this house. Erica scowled at me. Didn't I tell you? I'm not your sister. They don't want me. They don't love me. It's just like Auntie said. She pulled away from me and ran toward the back door, but I grabbed her before she opened it. Holding her tight, I made her face Mom and Dad. Please look at her, I told them. She's been living with a crazy old woman up on Brewster's Hill. She doesn't remember anything about us, just like Celine. But she is Erica. She can't be, Mom whispered. Dad shook his head. With his back to Erica and me, he stared out the kitchen window at the black night. How could they not recognize their own daughter? Yes, she was dirty, her hair uncombed. She was thin and pale, obviously in the same state as Celine. But under it all, she was my sister and their daughter, the one they'd been mourning for almost a week. Erica began to cry. Let me go, she begged. I don't belong here. I don't belong anywhere. I might as well be dead. Please don't talk like that. Slowly, Mom reached out and touched Erica's shoulder. I don't know who you are, but I can't bear to see a child so unhappy. Erica collapsed against Mom's side. Her bare feet were blue with cold. Her face was bruised, and she was shaking hard enough to make her teeth chatter. I'm so tired, she whispered. Please, can I sleep by your fire till morning? I promise I won't be no bother. If you got work for me to do, I'll do it. I'll sweep, I'll scrub floors, I'll chop wood. You'll do no such thing, Mom said. You're in no condition to work for us or anyone else. And you certainly won't sleep by the fire, Dad said. Auntie says my place is on the hearth, Erica said. By the fire. It's warm there, and I don't mind the hard floor no more. You poor child. I don't know who your aunt is, but she's not fit to take care of you. Dad bent and picked Erica up. She lay as limp as a kitten in his arms, her eyes half-closed. She hardly weighs anything, he said. I watched him carry her upstairs to her room. She was fast asleep, 
before Mom covered her with her lavender-checked comforter. Mom and Dad stood together, looking down at her, with their eyes full of questions. Alright, and that is it for Part 9. Next time we're going to go ahead and finish up. Alright, so this was uh, my second recording of this video, because the first time it was um, <laughs> my neighbor's barking dog, so I will be uh, deleting that video and uploading this one. Um, in that video, it also told you, my friends, that I had uh, an exciting weekend. I have broken my foot. That is why I'm in a different setting here than I have been lately and why I don't have my microphone. I cannot physically go up and down the stairs to go get it and bring it here. Um, I had my kids bring me my laptop and books so we could, so we could read. Um, hopefully the sound is okay. If not, I apologize and I will go back on mic as soon as I can. So, um, watch in this area for a button for when the conclusion of Took is ready. Uh, comment, like, subscribe, do all those fun things. Until next time, keep reading.